good morning to everyone and welcome to the launch of the Design Beyond Deception project by the Pranava Institute. I know it's very early in the morning, not just for people in this room, person in this room, thank you, but um, also for people joining us online from um, different places. Uh, but nonetheless, in the interest of time, we'd like to go ahead and um, begin. So first off, um, I extend a very warm welcome. Uh, on behalf of the team at Pranava Institute, three of us here present on the stage. Um, and we are very glad to um, launch this project at the UN Internet Governance Forum 2023 in Kyoto. Um, next slide. Um, so a big hello from the Pranava Institute to all of you. Um, the Pranava Institute works at the intersection of emerging technology policy and its impact on society based in India. Our research essentially focuses um, on issues such as trust and safety, deceptive design and youth and media, and we've done a whole bunch of projects, both academic as well as multimedia, in this space. Next slide. So getting right into it, um, what is deceptive design and why does it matter, right? I'll pick up a very um, simple definition which was actually put forward by the Norwegian Consumer Council on this. Plainly put, dark patterns are often carefully designed to alter decision making by users or trick users into actions they did not intend to take. Now, um, deceptive design is something we've all encountered on the web, right? Um, they have found their way into a plethora of online experiences, from e-commerce app to social media, from fintech services to education and so forth. Now, these design choices, which may seem very innocent and innocuous on the outside, have multi-sided harms actually baked into them. And by tricking, manipulating, misdirecting, or hiding information from users, these patterns harm not just the single end user of the internet, but also digital ecosystems at large. And that is also, um, th those are also findings which resulted from the work that we did on this issue. Um, this project called Design Beyond Deception sought to understand the harmful impacts of deceptive design specifically in understudied contexts because a lot of the academic work so far on deceptive design was limited to the United States and European Union and we wanted to look at what it looks like in other countries, right, where the nature of digitalization itself is different. Uh, we also wanted to see how we can replace such design practices with design practices that embody values, right? And these are values that consumers, that companies, um, civil society, governments want reflected online, right? Um, and that's precisely why our project also had a very strong practice or application component and not just a theoretical one. Then, yeah. Um, now, moving on to what are the harms caused by these deceptive design patterns, right? And there are two ways in which we categorize these harms, right? One is the personal consumer detriment, which is um, focused on harms which um, you and I as people can identify we have undergone, right? These include uh, privacy harms, financial loss, a lot of financial loss uh, has been documented in countries such as India, psychological detriment, and time and resource lost, loss which happens. But at the same time, if we look deeply into the problem of deceptive design, we also realize that there are also structural consumer detriments as well as harms on the larger digital economy, including loss of trust. So a lot of research showed that when, when websites and apps used force registration or price comparison prevention and so on, it weakens or distorts competition in a digital market. What that essentially means is that um, because of the use of these deceptive patterns, there is um, unfair trade practice being done in the digital economy. And this currently does not find any anchoring in um, our laws, but that's precisely why this topic has to be issued, uh, has to be discussed at a platform such as this. Next, um, I want to talk about why we are talking about deceptive design, which seems like a more designer-centered issue at the UNIGF. And the simple reason is, um, we are increasingly seeing regulators worldwide investigating deceptive practices in their specific contexts. These include the Federal Trade Commission in the United States. It includes the European Commission and the BUEC, which have been looking at this issue for a while and trying to understand how it can create a stronger European consumer protection law. Um, and it's also found um, mentioned in the DSA. 
and consumer councils in countries such as the Netherlands, Norway, Australia, and very recently India also issued guidelines and working papers and have been trying to push policy um, on deceptive design. Finally, data protection authorities have been at the forefront in several jurisdictions to talk about the privacy and data harms which result from deceptive practices. Now, regulators are investigating the consumer harms, privacy and data harms, and competition harms which result from these patterns. And um, this is precisely where I want to move into a little bit about what our project was about. So the Design Beyond Deception project was, eight, was an 18 month long um, project which sought to bridge the gap between the theory and the practice. Uh, we held more than four large group focused consultations, um, engaged with over 50 global experts in various domains and held 20 plus in depth interviews on this issue. Um, we also issued a research series, which is uh, of also being launched today by authors uh, from across the world who focused on understudied areas. And this, uh, this research was very generously supported by the University of Notre Dame and IBM's Tech Ethics Lab in the United States. Now, very quickly going over the project process, we started out uh, with, of course, a review of academic literature, given the multidisciplinary uh, and cross-sectional nature of the issue itself. Second, to tap into the in-depth expertise from multiple stakeholders placed across fields of theory and practice, we did scoping interviews with experts, which helped us give shape to the rest of the project. Third, we thought that creating a new body of work which contextualizes deceptive design specifically will um, help deepen the conversation significantly on the issue. And that led to focus groups and workshops with stakeholders, which led us to our final goal, uh, which is the creation of a manual for design practitioners who otherwise would not have um, in, as a part of their curriculum or training as designers and understanding of deceptive practices and how it may harm um, their end users. So the stakeholders we engaged with for this particular project were academics and researchers, design practitioners, startups, um, civil society and policy folk, and of course industry which included um, a whole bunch of people from top to bottom who are involved in different decision making processes which very, um, very much so impact um, you know, design uh, decisions in a company. Um, while our manual themes span um, what is deceptive design for a, for, a, for a designer and not for a researcher, we also look at rethinking the user, designing with values, design for privacy. Uh, we touch upon culturally responsible design and finally look at how regulation meets um, design, wherein we also probe the um, design practitioner to look at designing our collective future from, from a different standpoint. And since this manual has been made for practitioners, it is full of frameworks, activities, and teamwork, things that uh, perhaps a product team can sit together and do on their own, right? Um, very quickly, talking about the research series, which also we are launching today. It focused essentially on understudied areas and understudied harms, including how, um, for example, crafting a definition for deceptive design is harder than it may seem. And for those of you who are lawyers uh, in this room, you would completely understand why this is a huge challenge. We also um, talk about how identifying anti-competitive harms in deceptive design discourse is crucial. Also, how deceptive design plays in voice interfaces and um, further such um, research pieces which were contributed from people across the world. So um, without further ado, I would um, ex like I would request you to explore this project online or pick up a copy of the manual and research series here from the table in the first row for you to peruse. And um, without taking much of the time, I would very quickly now want to invite the speakers who have graciously joined us online. Um, we have two speakers, Chandini Gupta and um, Maitreya Shah who have joined us online and I hope they can hear me. Um, we also have videos from two speakers who because of um, time zone issues could not join us um, online but have been very generous. So um, to quickly introduce the uh, speakers, Chandni is currently the deputy CEO and digital policy director at the Consumer Policy Research Center, which is Australia's only dedicated consumer policy think tank. She has previously worked at the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the OECD and the United Nations. She has over 15 years of experience in consumer 
policy domestically as well as internationally. And her research focuses on exploring consumer shift from the analog towards the digital economy. Her work was extremely crucial um, in, in the sense that it was the first study in Australia, which, oh, I'm sorry, just, uh, yeah. It was the first study in Australia which essentially led to policy change and consumer um, action on deceptive design. Um, Maitreya, who's also joining us online today. Maitreya Shah is a blind lawyer and researcher. His work lies in the intersection of ethics and governance of emerging technologies and disability rights. He um, was most recently at Regulatory Genome, a spin out of the University of Cambridge and was previously a LAMP to Member of Parliament Fellow in India. He has extensively worked in areas of digital accessibility, AI governance, regulatory technologies and disability law. Currently, he is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Howard University, where he will be examining AI fairness frameworks from the standpoint of disability justice. Um, we also have two recordings from Carolyn Sinders and Professor Christiana Santos. Um, Carolyn Sinders is an award-winning critical designer, researcher, and artist. They're founder of a human rights and design lab called Convocation Research plus design, and she's also currently at the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the UK's data protection and privacy regulator. Finally, Professor Christiana Santos um, is uh, an assistant professor in privacy and data protection law at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She's also an expert of the Data Protection Unit Council of Europe and expert for the implementation of the EDPB support pool of experts amongst her um, many varied accomplishments. Um, without Further ado, I would um, request Dhaneshri to um, play the video um, by Carolyn Sinders, who will touch upon um, deceptive design from a design practitioner's standpoint. I'm a, I'm a researcher and postdoctoral fellow with the Information Commissioner's Office in the United Kingdom. That's the Data Protection and Privacy Regulator. I also run a human rights lab called Convocation Research and Design. I really wish I could be there in person. Um, I'm so sorry I can't be, so I've made this recording instead. Um, thank you so much to the Pravana Institute for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm one of the contributors to their recent toolkit that's out on deceptive design patterns, and I'm excited to present to you today talk a little bit about why design and interdisciplinary thinking is so important when it when it comes to creating regulation, investigations, and other ways to help curb and mitigate the harms of deceptive design patterns. I've also created a very small presentation that I'm excited to show to all of you. Harmful design patterns are everywhere. They're very prolific in the modern web and they're universally found. Um, I have not, in all of my extensive research, ever come across a country or region that does not have harmful design patterns. They are, in fact, a global phenomenon and a global menace is the way to think about it. My article for the Pravana Institute's toolkit focuses on what do, what do we do with emergent spaces, let's say like the metaverse or IoT or voice activation when design patterns are not standardized yet for users, meaning users have not engaged engaged with um, voice, uh, like voice activation enough to understand what all the design patterns are within that space. Or in the case of something like the metaverse, where there's not a lot of people using that and it's a really emergent space, what are the, de what are the healthy design patterns within that? We haven't really come to that space yet. A lot of current design patterns are because we've existed in this kind of flattened modern web for quite a few years. And so there's been many years of research to figure out what could healthy or trustworthy or pro-user design look like. And it's that subversion where harmful design patterns exist. This kind of research is so important um, because uh, it, it will impact how users create safety, it will impact forms of regulation. Um, and this kind of work does really require an interdisciplinary lens. And so what does policy need to help combat harmful design patterns? Again, it's this understanding that design is an expertise, and as I was saying earlier, this integral part of the web. What we need is to sort of broaden um, our idea of what 
let's say, our researcher looks like or what knowledge looks like. One of the things that's been exciting in the many years that I've been researching harmful design patterns is the ability to work with all different kinds of legal experts who recognize that design is an expertise. What this means is when we're investigating things like design, harmful design patterns, is actually having a knowledge of what are what are design patterns, what are different kinds of standardized design patterns, how to run different kinds of evaluations, like a heuristic evaluation or a usability evaluation or an accessibility evaluation. These are things that actually are, there are many different ways to do them, but there are um, agreed upon tests in a way or a series of different kinds of tests people can conduct. But these are the ways in which you can sort of look at, let's say, like the health of a product or how well or not well that product is designed. Often when investigating harmful design patterns, what you need to find or sort of look at or help surface is where does the confusion or manipulation or exploitation lie? So where is the harmful design pattern actually subverting this expected, this expected design, design pattern, pattern, the expected design pattern, design pattern the user the thinks user that, thinks that, they're, that engaging they're engaging with, with right? Because that's because what's that's being what's subverted being unintentionally, unintentionally, let's say, or intentionally. Or intentionally. And this is and where this is having where a background in UX design, design is really, really important to be able to recognize that. that. Um, um, a paper done paper by the European done, Privacy Board actually, actually found that, found that, that um, they were testing they were with, with um, a few thousand users. Yeah, they, they found, found those that were less susceptible, were less susceptible to harmful design patterns were ones that had heard of UX design or knew what UX design was, right? And this is really important to kind of highlight. This means we're creating an unequal, an unequal and unequitable web if the only way for people to try to avoid harmful design patterns is to have a design background. So conversely, I think to help investigate more, this kind of interdisciplinary knowledge is needed. Understanding how products are made, how they're tested, and having, and again, being able to conduct different kinds of analysis, let's say on the interface itself. Design, um, inconsistent design, and we see these a lot in different kinds of harmful design patterns can confuse users. Um, they can overwhelm. So if there's too many features or too many choices, let's say, um, misunderstanding a core audience can also lead to poor or unhelpful design decisions. But we'll see this in an example I'm going to show. So inconsistent design, design can be a product name changing choices or changing name. Uh, choices are not illustrated the same way. Um, the name doesn't match up with what the user thinks they're doing. All of these things can confuse users. Um, this also means sometimes if you're engaging or calling something something too technical, then a user might understand what it is. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so sorry that this is a short talk. But one thing I wanted to sort of really emphasize, again, is design can be an equalizing action that distills code and policy into understandable interfaces. What we need more is more research, more collaborative and interdisciplinary research between policymakers, regulators, policy analysis, and designers. Um, thanks, Carolyn. And now uh, moving on to Chandini, who's um, joined us online. Um, I would request Dhanishree to put up the slides. And over to you, Chandni. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I'm just, I just want to confirm that you can hear me and you can see my slides. Yes, yes. all good. All good. Okay. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction earlier, and thank you so much for having me. Um, before I begin, I do have to say, Congratulations, Pranava Institute, who have created such a practical tool, which um, I'm sure and I hope will become a valuable resource for the UX community from here on. Um, I'm delighted to share with you today some of the insights uh, from our research. So one of the things that we at the Consumer Policy Research Centre do is look at what is the evidence-based research that can bring about systemic change. And this was one of, one of the ones that we have been working on for, um, for a number of months now. So it was about 18 months ago that uh, we started our journey into looking at deceptive and manipulative designs. And as part of our research, what we really wanted to understand were two things. What are the common deceptive patterns that Australians come across most frequently and what's the impact on consumers. And we had Karin say how important it is to be able to understand that impact. Um, and what we really wanted to do was quantify that harm. 
Uh, dark patterns today um, are so prominent across websites and apps we use every day. Uh, they're used to influence our decisions, our choices, our experiences. Um, is it in our best interest? Often not. Is it illegal? Largely not. So in case you're wondering where dark patterns exist, as Caroline said as well, they are so prominent, they are everywhere. Um, even as part of our research, we asked a national representative sample of 2000 Australians in our survey to list the names of those businesses they could recall using deceptive designs. And businesses from almost 50 different sectors were identified. I mentioned before that many of the dark patterns that exist today aren't illegal. Currently in Australia, we can look through the lens of misleading and deceptive conduct, unfair contract terms, or the Privacy Act. But the law currently offers a very narrow lens for how regulators um, can act. But are con consumers experiencing harm? Well, the short answer is yes. Our research revealed that 83% of Australians had experienced one or more negative consequences as a result of dark patterns being used on websites and apps. Yet eight out of the 10 dark patterns we looked at could be implemented here in Australia without any consequence to businesses. Consumers in our survey reported being compromised in their emotional well-being, experiencing financial loss and feeling a real loss of control over their personal information. And it was anything from feeling pressured into sharing more data than they needed or accidentally making a purchase. In fact, um, as part of our qualitative part of our research, the frustration really came through. And it came down to three elements. Uh, one, there's a lack of meaningful choice. Sometimes accepting the preferred business choice is the only way to access a product or service. For example, in our suite, we saw an example of a fitness center that didn't let you see their timetable until you created a profile on their app. Uh, two, it's the pervasive amount of pressure that's put on consumers, especially once their personal details have been shared and suddenly they're prone to hyper-personalized content or continuous direct mail. And three, and finally, there's a some sense of frustration that businesses aren't being held accountable for any of these practices. When it comes to younger consumers, the impact only compounded. Consumers aged between 18 and 28 were more likely to experience both financial and data harms. Uh, for example, one in three spent more than they intended, and that was 65% above the national average. This demographic in Australia often has less disposable income, so the impact of harms is likely to be felt more as well. On the flip side, there's also a cost for businesses. Almost one in three of the consumers we survey stopped using the website altogether. Um, almost one in six felt their trust in the organization had been undermined, and more than one in four thought negatively about the organization. So while in the short term, dark patterns may lead to financial and data gains, in the long run, they will deteriorate consumer trust and loyalty. So our research has highlighted is that everyone in the digital ecosystem has a role to play. And the Diksha mentioned this earlier as well. There's definitely a role for governments and regulators. And we've been really pleased to see some of the changes that are coming about, such as look, government currently considering here introducing an unfair trading prohibition and dark patterns being included as part of that legislation. And the Privacy Act uh, is finally getting reviewed, which currently is from the 1980s. So it not only predates dark patterns, it predates the internet. Um, however, it's actually businesses who are in the best position right now to make changes today and lead by example, whether it's auditing their online presence or testing with consumers' best interests in mind. Even small businesses can be really mindful about the off-the-shelf e-commerce products they're choosing and which features they're turning on and off. Now, from what I've heard from UX designers that have reached out to me during conferences and events is that it's often not in their hands, 
And much of this is a business decision that happens in another part of the company. But one of the things that they can do is share this type of research resources such as the Pranada's handbook and other work that's happening in this space with their colleagues to show the impact better online um, patterns can actually have not only on consumers but also on their business. I'll end with saying we've actually all got a role to play in ensuring a fair, safe and inclusive digital economy for consumers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Chandani, for that presentation. And I would very much like to point out that Chandani's research uh, and the research done at her institute, in fact, very recently helped push um, the case for making unsubscription or uh, unsubscribe easier um, on e-commerce platforms like Amazon. Um, and that's a big move, um, right, coming from um, regulators. So more power to you, and thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, I would now like to um, request Dhanishree to play um, a recorded video we have uh, from Professor Christiana Santos, who will talk uh, about deceptive design from a legal standpoint um, and share some of her work. the first time in a decision. Uh, we suggest that along uh, with this DPA, uh, other enforcers name and publicize violations as dark patterns in their decisions. This way, we believe that organizations can factor the risk of sanctions into their business calculations. And also policymakers can be aware of the true extent of these practices, right? And naming dark patterns is now more important than ever, especially since the DSA and the DMA codify dark patterns explicitly. So it's a legal term. We also found that the dark patterns are used both by big tech, but also by small and public organizations. Most decisions refer to the user interface or to the user experience or user journey and to information-based practices. Finally, we understood that harms caused by dark patterns are not scoped in decisions yet. Let's have a look at the privacy-related dark patterns we found in these decisions. So in this table, uh, you can see uh, the data protection cases according to the practices related to dark patterns types. The majority of dark patterns uh, are referred to obstruction practices, and they are related to the difficulty of refusal and withdrawal of consent, more than 30 decisions. These are followed by forced practices. So when users withdraw consent, but unnecessary trackers are loaded or trackers are stored before consent is asked, more than 25 decisions. Finally, um, policy to use a service at the same time and in both, for example. 
So we understand that enforcement cases are a way for a general deterrence of dark patterns. And we showcase these dark patterns decisions in this website, deceptive design slash cases. And this website is being updated daily with new decisions. So let's talk about the harms caused by dark patterns. There is a growing body of evidence from human computer interaction studies, from uh, uh, computer uh, science studies, referring to dark patterns that actually might elicit or lead to potential or uh, actual harm. But there are also harms related to dark patterns in privacy. Um, several studies focused on consent interactions, and they show several harms caused by dark patterns labor and connected cognitive harms, loss of control, privacy concerns and fatigue, negative emotional responses, regretting privacy choices, and all these harms uh, provide evidence of severity of harms. And for a concrete example, scholarly works find that the pre-selected purposes, pre-selected options for processing data, or even accept all purposes option at the first layer of a consent banner, uh, can uh, or may use uh, users' personal data or even very sensitive data, depending on the website in question, and can and uh, these can share these personal data by default with hundreds uh, of third-party advertisers. And this might provide evidence of a potential severity and uh, impact uh, regarding dark patterns harms. Mm, however, constant claims, at least uh, this, this, the scoped ones, for non-material damages are not being used within the redressed system even though there are so many decisions related to dark patterns and related to violations of consent interactions. Uh, finally, we know that dark patterns occur in different domains, not only in privacy rights, and uh, there are several data protection regulators and policymakers that show interest in contributing to this space of dark patterns. And we find at least five reports from the EU, from the UK and US bodies published in 2022 alone. But these sources often lack the citation provenance trails for typologies and definitions, making it difficult to trace where new specific types of dark patterns emerge and under which conditions. On the other hand, academic literature has grown rapidly since Brignol released his original typology in 2010. In the years since, foundational work by Bosch, Frey, Matur, Luguri, Strachy, Letzit have added many new dark patterns. These typologies have had some overlaps and also some misalignments. We analyzed those academic and regulatory taxonomies and counted 245 dark patterns. Yes. Many of these dark patterns indeed either overlap or misalign with other types of dark patterns coming from all these different sources. And so we constructed an ontology of dark patterns knowledge. We aggregated existing patterns, identified their provenance through direct citations and inferences. We clustered similar patterns. So we, uh, we created this high level, meso middle level and low level patterns. And this ontology of dark patterns enable a shared vocabulary for regulators and dark pattern scholars, enabling more alignment in user studies, in mapping to decisions and discussions of harms, and for scholars also to help to trace the presence and types of dark patterns over time. Regulators could anticipate the, pre the presence of existing patterns in new contexts or domains and to guide automated detection. Thank you for your time. And if you have any question and any suggestion, please um, consider to send me an email. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Professor Santos for um, that presentation and for um, showing us very clearly how deceptive designs now are a part of the legal discourse increasingly as um, 
different countries across the world look at it um, uh, closer and make it a part of their case law. Um, I would now finally um, like to invite Maitreya Shah um, to share his comments with us. And thank you so much, Maitreya, for your patience. Um, and thank you so much for being with us. Um, hi, Titiksha. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, Metra, you're all set. Thank you so much. And congratulations for launching this at uh, one of the best platforms possible in the world to talk about this. Uh, so yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Maitreya, and thank you so much, uh, Tateksha and Pranava, for that generous uh, introduction. So, uh, my fellow speakers have already touched upon, you know, many forms of deceptive designs and how they, you know, interact with consumers, how they pose harm to people, and what are the the dark patterns that exist uh, on the internet and elsewhere today. Um, you know, dark patterns, deceptive designs are quite multidisciplinary with the rise of AI and emerging technologies. Um, I uh, intend to talk about two things very briefly. The first is the piece that I wrote for the research series that Panawa is launching today, which deals with accessibility overlays and their harms on people with disabilities. The other is briefly uh, to my work, because um, a lot of my work is on AI uh, bias, fairness, and ethics. Uh, and I tend to, uh, you know, briefly touch upon the deceptive design dark patterns that are emerging through AI and emerging technologies and, and the new uh, models that we see in the world today. So to start with, deceptive design practices uh, in accessibility overlay tools. So I wrote an analytic, analytical piece for the research series, uh, the ethical design research series of Pranava. And uh, I evaluated uh, what are called accessibility overlay tools. So before I delve into uh, you know, what accessibility overlay tools are and what their deceptive design practices are, I will uh, give you a brief on accessibility. So accessibility is uh, the idea to make websites and applications usable for people with disabilities. It is a legal right and a legal obligation to various instruments, international and domestic. I've given here a few examples. And uh, these accessibility overlay tools are basically designed to subvert the legal obligations to make websites accessible. And uh, I have tried to analyze uh, these tools from a deceptive design lens and call out their dark patterns and how they uh, end up harming people with disabilities on the internet. So uh, a generic overlay, as a lot of you who come from the design side of things know, is uh, usually on the UI or UX side of websites or web applications. It is, uh, uh, you know, in the forms of pop-ups or these, you know, uh, JavaScript boxes that usually come up and they tend to deviate uh, or obstruct the attention of users on websites and you know uh, shift their focus to something different like sign up boxes or advertisements and so on an accessibility overlay tool is is exactly like this however what it claims to do is it claims to make the website accessible for people with disabilities uh, now uh, in line with a lot of international standards and regulations, the Worldwide Consortium has uh, come out with uh, a web accessibility guidelines and standards that are guiding developers and designers to make websites accessible. And these standards require a lot of manual labor and a lot of manual uh, design input right from the source code. Uh, so these accessibility overlay tools do not end up making any changes in the source code. They only make changes to the user interface side of things. They only basically change the font, color, contrast, or size, or maybe, you know, add some image descriptions on the website, which are things that are already built in the assistive technology of people with disabilities. So accessibility overlay tools are not doing anything new. Thing, uh, assistive technology like screen readers that people with blindness, for example, use 
uh, already have a lot of these uh, features built in. So what are the harms? So these uh, companies that sell these accessibility overlay tools claim that they are making the website accessible. And what ends up happening is whenever there is an accessibility overlay tool in a website, there is a toolbar and an announcement on the top of the website on its landing page that says that you know the website is accessible and the person visiting the website can utilize this feature to get an accessible um, you know, experience and an interaction on the website. So people with disabilities, uh, they are, uh, you know, their, their trust gets kindled. They tend to use the website with the anticipation that the website would be accessible. And uh, what ends up happening is that they are deceived and manipulated to choices that they do not intend to make, which is inherently the idea of deceptive design. Uh, this is done to, as I earlier said, subvert the legal obligation to make websites accessible. Uh, companies, they uh, employ designers that don't incorporate accessibility features from the very inception of a website building process. And then they are afraid of lawsuits and paying hefty compensations. So they resort to these uh, sort of contrivances and these sort of shortcuts to make their websites accessible. Uh, So there are many issues uh, before I come to the strategies of countering these tools. There are many issues that, that end, end up uh, happening with people with disabilities when these overlay tools uh, are deployed in a website or a web interface. So firstly, uh, many screen readers uh, that blind people especially use get obstructed by these overlay tools. Uh, these overlay tools also tend to uh, impede the privacy uh, of people with disabilities because they detect assistive technology that is being used by the uh, users. Um, and there are many other issues like false and inaccurate image descriptions that might lure or manipulate people into purchasing things that they do not want to. Uh, you know, in, in line with the idea of today's uh, discussion, I have given here a few points around strategies that would move us from theory to practice. How do we you know, counter these accessibility overlay tools? How do we see that there are, you know, companies don't use these tools and that they don't harm people with disabilities? So these are a few examples that uh, I have personally researched and uh, I've, I've gathered from across the globe that, that uh, are, you know, somehow effective strategies to counter uh, the deceptive practices of these tools, including regulatory actions, uh, community advocacy, uh, tools that could counter these uh, accessibility overlays and educating and sensitizing designers and web developers uh, to start with. So this was uh, possible through, you know, uh, Pranava's uh, collaboration and consultation that I could have with them to think about, you know, how uh, these accessibility issues could be manifest in, in uh, deceptive design language and how they harm people with disabilities to understand this uh, issue that is quite marginalized and very less talked about. Uh, I'll quickly move to, uh, you know, artificial intelligence technologies. Uh, there is a lot of hype and a lot of discussion around chat GPT and generative AI tools today. You know, we interact with chatbots and with uh, these new forms of uh, uh, large language model technologies uh, today. So these are the kind of issues that, that one faces. I, in my presentation, have two broad issues that I wanted to focus on, uh, two examples that I wanted to share with you that, that have come uh, in, up in my research so far. And I'll, I'll be very brief because I'm mindful of the uh, lack of time. So a lot of regulators are, uh, you know, they are uh, talking about and they are making people aware about the deceptive design practices to anthropomism, which is uh, basically, you know, human characteristics that are uh, uh, carried by non-human identities. So for example, chatbots and generative AI models that uh, 
take on human characteristics and blur those boundaries between humans and tech and that tend to manipulate users that tend to uh, subvert users autonomy and their privacy in the previous slide i'd given an example where a person back in 2021 was influenced by a chatbot and had attempted to assassinate the queen of the united kingdom so these are the kind of issues that uh, one could face because of chatbots in and large language models maitreya um, i'm so sorry are, to interrupt yeah. you um, could you just very quickly wrap up we're one minute over time and um, i would just i'll do that yeah thank you sure thank you this is very briefly again uh, an example from data mining practices and how they intend to violate uh, the privacy of users uh, i'll quickly move to and these are a few examples again to move from theory to practice how regulators are trying to uh, shape the discussion around ai and emerging tech and deceptive design practices and how you or i as as uh, lawyers designers or or community advocates can influence the work on this um yeah that's it thank you so much um uh, and sorry for running over time thank you so much um for joining us maitreya and for sharing um your specific research at the intersection of deceptive design and um disability and i wish you all the best um for a lot of your forthcoming work um on ai and deceptive design um that being said in the interest of time let me thank everyone um for joining us uh, for this particular launch event um you see the qr code to our project right up here on the screen and if you'd like to grab a physical copy of the manual or the research series they're right here on the front um desk right up here um again i would like to extend um my gratitude to both chandni and maitreya who are joining us at very very odd times but uh, thank you for uh, making it to this event and um, thank you to everyone for attending um, this particular session um we are definitely available offline if you are interested in this issue and want to talk more about it thank you